Thou hast loved us, love us dear. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, Thou hast loved us, love us dear. Just when I need Him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fall. Welcome to our worship service. Let us bow together in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for blessing us, for bringing us here to worship you. Help us to open our hearts to receive your message, to bask in the glory of your presence. Heavenly Father, thank you for being so good to us. I pray that we may focus on serving you with our lives. We may receive nourishment through this service today and that we may shore up our lives to where we can serve you better with, with every action that we take. Bless us now, Heavenly Father. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Good to see each and every one of you here today. We, uh, we, we worship together with friends on the radio and television. We, we reach out through our bus ministry but we certainly are glad to have you here with us, every one of you. If you do want to ride the bus, be sure and call the church office, 359-4077, and we'll make sure that you get picked up. Uh, I understand that we had some new people today on the bus route that uh, uh, they, they, uh, they called and asked for a ride, so uh, hopefully we'll uh, be able to expand that ministry. But thank you for joining us. Um, we, we're among friends, forever friends. We're, we're Christians looking forward to eternity together. So 
uh, let's all stand together and welcome one another and thank them for being here. Good morning, good morning. I have big kids and little kids up here this morning, so I'm glad to see all of you. Glad to see all of you. This morning, I want to talk to y'all about something. I got a shoebox here. Now, I'm going to ask you. I want some of you to just guess. If you had to pack up everything in your bedroom, all your toys, all your art supplies, all that, how many shoeboxes would it take? A bunch, right? Yeah, a bunch. This is our Operation Christmas Child box. And it's just a shoe box. And it won't hold a whole lot. But did you guys know that there are some kids in the world that if they got this shoe box full of stuff, it would mean so much to them. So much. Because we're very fortunate here in our lives to have all the blessings that we have. We have an overabundance of blessings. We just, we can't count them all. We can't pack them in a shoebox. But just imagine on Christmas morning, if you went down and looked under a tree at your house and you had one box, I know there's not a one of you that wouldn't go, uh-uh, where's everything else at? That's how blessed we are. We don't know how good we've got it. But there are children all over the world. I want to share with you the story of a, uh, there was a missionary lady. And she went to a foreign country. And she happened to be in that country when those kids got their shoe boxes. And she got to see the joy on their faces when they opened their shoe boxes. And the one thing that stuck out in her mind that has just 
hit me in my heart was a little boy who opened his box. And do you know the one thing in that box that meant the most to him? Had a brand new pencil in it. Among all the other stuff, the toys, the hard candies, the toothbrush, there was a pencil, a new pencil. And that was his favorite thing in there. And he went immediately and showed his teacher from his school, his little one-room school. And you know what his teacher did? She broke that pencil into about six pieces so that five other children could have a pencil to use in their school. Now that hit me hard because I see children every day who drop a pencil and you say, oh, you dropped your pencil. And they're like, man, I got another one. Yeah, I got another one. But this child was so happy with that one pencil that he was willing to share it with other children. Now, we are blessed, aren't we? We are blessed. And the Bible tells us about how blessed we are and what we're to do. In 1 John 3, verse 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. So I encourage each of you, not just you guys, but all of you guys, please pick up a shoebox. If you're as blessed as many of us are, pick up more than one and fill them with love. Fill them with a letter from you. Put a picture of yourself in there. You know, they might write back. Most of all, remember that you're sharing the love of Jesus Christ with somebody who might not otherwise have that chance. Okay? Let's say our prayers this morning. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we just praise you for all the blessings that you pour out on us, Lord. We're just, we're just so unaware of all the blessings that we do have. Lord, just help us to, to share those blessings. Help us to be grateful for those blessings. And help us to share your love throughout our community, and our world, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. Good morning. It's not in your uh, paperwork that you got this morning, so if you'll bear with me. We're going to read two scriptures this morning, so if you'll mark your place on page 1011 and hold that place for just a few minutes. It's going to be 2 Timothy 1, 5 through 7. Hold that spot. But first, we're going to read in Matthew, page 822. So if you're in your pew Bible, we'll go to 822. Matthew 10, verses 26 through 28. Therefore, don't be afraid of them, since there is nothing covered that won't be uncovered, and nothing hidden that won't be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. What you hear in a whisper, proclaim on the housetops. Don't fear those who kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And then flipping over to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Clearly recalling your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother's, Lois, then in your mother, Eunice, and that I am convinced is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to keep ablaze the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fearfulness, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. And if you don't mind, bow your heads, we'll say a prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you today. We are so blessed. We have incredible blessings, like Amy was telling the kids there a while ago. It's, a, it's a, an amazing world that we live in, and, and we have been overly, abundantly blessed. We'd like to say thank you for those things. And we, we know in our world, locally and across the world, there's a, there's a list of growing concerns, and there's always something going on in the world that, that causes us concern, but we also know you are the answer to each of these.
and we want to say thank you for that. We want to ask you to, for, for all of these concerns, so we want to lift them up to you and ask that you lay your hands on us with, with comfort and guidance and healing and anything that we might need. We know that, that that's the only way to have that peace we're looking for. We thank you for that, and we know that throughout the entire world that we will be better through you, and we ask that you continue to lead us down that path you'd have us follow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing down at the cross, and must Jesus bear the cross alone? Be seated. Amy, thank you for bringing us a children's sermon that I always understand. <laughs> Wonderful message about being blessed, and we are, and we're coming into a season where everyone feels particularly left out, where everyone feels alone, where some are never satisfied. But God has blessed us. He has blessed us so richly. He has given us the ability to come here today and worship. He's given us the family and friends that we enjoy. 
He's given us a wonderful Savior that will always be with us. Let's pray thanking him for those blessings. Heavenly Father, we take this time to honor you with our prayer to glorify your name. We thank you for reaching out to us, for giving us so many blessings that we couldn't begin to name them or identify them. You just pour them on. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll continue to help us to see the needs around us, to share those blessings, to reach out, to share the message that you've put in our heart of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the message today that Amy brought, helping us realize beyond our community, beyond our, our church family, that there are needs that we must reach out to. Help us to give from the heart. Help us to share shamelessly, to share openly, and to, to share in love. Bless this offering that we take. I pray that we may be wise and, and use it to further your kingdom that you will help us to realize the distance that we can reach by, by giving back to you. In Christ's name I pray, amen.
It's a hard act to follow. Amy is. And this <coughs> youth choir, <coughs> right before we came to Lewisburg, one of our, we had a great youth group there too. And they did a musical and one of the songs in it was, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, no more sorrow or grieving, going on home. So I told them, I want y'all to sing that at my funeral. Well, they'll be too old uh, for that. But y'all can sing that at my funeral. John Marks, you and Jack and the choir, so y'all did a great, great job. That gives you a motivation for keep living, John. Uh, I'm sure there's times you wish you'd seen me dead. Uh, I think that it would be good to explain the scriptures that I ask pray to read before you hear what uh, I have to try to say. One thing is, I'm so proud we have a pastor that's well versed in the Greek and the Hebrew. And I'm proud for my, I am now, for my years of taking Greek and the Hebrew, although the Hebrew didn't stay with me much, but the Greek did. You see, it's very important to recognize where Ray read there about fear and what to fear tells us you better fear God. And there are things to fear. There are things to fear. But if you read it in the English as we, as we do, we translate the same word over in Timothy that is there. The other one is from phobos. You all have phobias, right? That's fear. But that's not the word that's used over there. Or used over there. It's an entirely little different word. Not even spelled anywhere close like it in the Greek. And it translates in modern translations. I have not given you, believers, a spirit of cowardice. And there's a difference in, in wise fear and pure cowardice. And that's what I'd like for us to understand as we look to the scriptures today of God's word. Let me ask you something. How many of you have been a little disturbed by what you've seen on TV lately. You spell it E-B-O-L-A. Well, it's not nearly as bad as H-E-L-L. -L. <laughs> <laughs> so keep that in mind as we talk. These are not 76 trombone days from the music man when the big fear was P-O-O-L. And it wasn't talking about a swimming pool. But there is trouble in our whole world today, and especially in the United States of America. If you don't believe it, watch the evening news and you can't sleep. Always watch the news in the morning. At least you have some time to get over what you've been told and how dra dreadful and drastic things are. Well... How many of you have been disturbed by I-S-I-S, I-S, ISIS? You better be. <laughs> you may be on the plane with somebody with Ebola. You may be on the street with somebody that is a convert to ISIS. So be careful. Are you surprised that the scriptures tell us some valuable truths? When Jesus was talking to his disciples, and we are his disciples, right? He talked about a lot of things in chapter 16 of Matthew, and I don't know the page number in your scripture, in your scripture you're using, but it is the John 16. And he talks about a lot of things there. These things have I spoken to you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he's doing God's service. Does that sound familiar, Isis? There will be tribulations, and there will be trials. Later in that chapter, 
Read that and it'll scare you to death. It'll make the news look tame. Behold, the hour is coming. Yea, it is now come that you shall be scattered every man to his own and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things, Jesus says, I have spoken to you that in, the, in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. The valuable truths that the Lord would have us to know, I believe, <clears throat> as we try to live uh, through these days, I, I think of the old song that was World War II, Grant Us Grace, <laughs> Grant Us Glory. Uh, our assurance is given to us in his word. One, know that we were forewarned by Christ himself. Number two, that we're not to be surprised by the intensity of our trials. And number three, we are assured that our God revealed, uh, who was revealed in Jesus Christ has conquered every trouble because of who he is and that he is our true and only hope. And if you have Jesus, you can cut down on the worries. And if you don't have him, you better get him. We have been forewarned. I've read those things to you. From John 14 through uh, the scripture passage in 16, we're warned very clearly. We're not to be surprised because Jesus predicted all of that. Some will think they're doing the Lord's will by killing believers. That was, as long as it was back there and that was Saul trying to kill David and that was others trying to kill Saul Paul in the New Testament or Apostle Peter, then we didn't have to worry too much. But folks, there are millions that want to kill you because you are a Christian. Not thousands, but millions in this world that want to kill you. Aren't you proud you send Rebecca Lambert out as a missionary to Korea? Or at least there's some good Christians there. Aren't you proud for these that Amy talked about? that there are Christians there. Aren't you proud that you can do something to change that sort of thinking by a shoebox full of, of, of goodies in the name of Christ? <clears throat> First Peter. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fire trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. And then he explains that's all is to hone us and to make us able to stand in the midst of such things. Paul said of suffering in Philippians 1, 29, that this is a scripture that has always troubled me, but is coming to life in my latter days. In Philippians 1, 29, it looks like it's contradictory. For unto you, believers... It is given in the behalf of Christ. Not only as we Baptists like to talk about, believe on him. Oh, we, pride, we put that up there. Not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. My pastor, when I surrendered ministry, and he left soon thereafter, but he talked to me some at the, at the beginning. And uh, he got me made the mission pastor with, uh, uh, before I was even licensed. But he used to say, Paul, I do believe before I die, I will know just how real my faith is. Now, he, he didn't have to go through some of the things that our world's going through now. But he went through some great trials in his life, health and family and other things. 
and that bears down on mine that I may very well know what it is, how real my faith is. Your, our pastor, Tom, says some very strong and good things. It goes out over television and others. There are folks in this world, not ISIS, not others, but fellow Americans who will take him to court for some of the things because of the laws of our nation. We need to pray for our pastor that he shall have the strength that he needs always. There was one bright hope today on the morning we turn on Channel 5 and get Good Morning America or whatever it is that that guy does. There was a college professor, a lifetime avowed atheist, I think her name's O-R-D-A-Y or something like that. And she has written a book about her experience with Christ. And now her fellow atheists are calling her a traitor. How long has it been since we've been called a traitor because we talked about Christ? Hmm? We we're forewarned, but thank God we're not just forewarned, we're assured by Christ, Jesus Christ himself that he has conquered all troubles and can turn troubles into blessings. I have overcome the world. He says, I have defeated death. He is our only hope. As I, a few weeks ago, by the way, I know you're tired of hearing me, but it's sort of like when I saw Betty at Union, when I went, first went up there, she was doing a devotional that morning watch, and I said, she wasn't so little and young, I'd asked her for a date. A year later, I was down at Memphis, and I'd come in to get, uh, finish up a science course that was two-part, and uh, I'd come in to get my mail. Uh, that the, so She was coming from her little job down at J.C. Penney's, and, we stood there and talked a few minutes, and I said, uh, what would you say if I asked you for a date? She said, I'd say, if you're fool enough to ask, I'm fool enough to go. <laughs> <laughs> that was the summer. By December, we were married, and we will celebrate, 50, if we live, uh, 53 uh, years of marriage this December the 16th. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, and that has nothing to do with our marriage. <laughs> Although it could, because she had uh, some very painful eye work done, but the doctor that got my sight back, Dr. Pollitzer, this week, and he says, well, yeah. you know, he's a converted Jew, and he's been to Israel recently. He's a member of Bel Brentwood Baptist Church. He, he told me the first thing when he set me down, I want you to know my background. I'm one of six children raised in an Orthodox Jewish home, and there are three of us have become Christians by different, different routes. And he's got every, the scripture passages and stuff up and all this, but he said to Betty, how are you this morning? She says, well, it's raining outside. My coffee was too hot for me to drink. We stopped and got Chick-fil-A. And she named off several, and I'm going to have this thing that's going to hurt that you're going to do to me. And besides that, I live with Paul. <laughs> she is honest <laughs> blessed are those who are persecuted Betty for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake you got that falsely didn't you rejoice and and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. If you doubt that that happened, you might want to read church history about one of the patriarchs of the church named Polycarp, who would not recant his faith in Christ. And they burned him to the stake 
But guess what he said as they were going out? I'm sorry, I just have one life to give for Christ. If you doubt that, ask that American preacher that's been in prison all this time in North Korea and his family's had to get along without him. If you don't believe that, ask those who've had themselves beheaded recently because they wouldn't recant. Better yet, the better question that I ought to ask, maybe you too, why haven't I been persecuted more? <laughs> why haven't I been reviled more? Because I believe in Christ. We've had ease in America, but the days of ease are over. The days of reality are upon us. And I believe for folks like this and folks like you that we're going to come out the victor if we put Jesus Christ first. Well, if you haven't been persecuted, don't worry. You will at some point. But when you do, be sure to remember his promise. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace in the world. Ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And it wouldn't be bad to read Romans 7, where Paul is doubting himself and all this, and when he wants to do good, and comes down, well, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And then he realized he'd already been delivered. And he says in Romans 8, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he says later in Romans 8, 28, that our God is so powerful that he can take the worst things that happen to us and turn them for the good of ourselves and the good of others. And remember, he tells you who to fear. Don't fear what other people can do to you, as Ray read, but fear the one that's not fearful. I taught speech, and I had to start every a new class that I ever taught in three different colleges. I had to start out with a speech myself on the different kinds of fear. Now, Matthew, I know that you have taught that boy and that girl certain fears, right? You don't touch hot stoves, right? And that's a good fear. You don't take drugs. That's a good fear. You don't do this, you don't do anything to sadden the Lord. That's a good fear. But our nation is full of phobias now. There are people that have, isn't it agrophobia, that they're scared to go outside and be with crowds. There are people that have this phobia and that phobia. The only thing we don't do that a mad dog does is foam into mouth. But Those are phobias that we need help with. But God didn't give anybody of those phobias. Paul wasn't saying when he said, our God has given, doesn't give a spirit of fear. He was saying he doesn't give us a spirit of cowardice. And he gives us the only anecdote that really works. A spirit of love. We ought to concentrate on loving the unlovable and winning the unlovable to the Lord that they can have the same assurance that we claim to have. Blessed assurance. My favorite song. Jesus is mine. I hope it is yours too and all of your family. Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer and then we're going to have a hymn of invitation. And hopefully I got you out on time. One word before I have this hymn of invitation. I just talked to the pastor that baptized me. Not him, he's dead. Uh, but I 
talk to. By the way, my third grade teacher is living. She'll be 100 this year. But uh, the, I talk to his daughter and do all the time. And Marion Mason Bill, the daughter of Elmer, T.E. Elmer Mason, who was my pastor. He wasn't a great preacher, but he was a great pastor. And his pastoring is what won me from the Lord. I was about eight years old, and he came to get his son, Sid, uh, with Sidney, his son, and all the other boys. My older brother, one that's just passed away, his age. And they were going on an RA fishing trip. I was standing there barefooted out in the back of the house, backyard, with the saddest look, I'm sure, on my face as those boys were getting ready to load up in his car to go fishing on a creek. Mr. Mason, Brother Mason, looked over and saw me. And he said, Miss Dolly, let Paul go too. She said, oh no, Howard wouldn't like that. He said, that's all right, I'll take care of him. I'll take care of him. And he took this barefoot boy and he stationed those guys fishing way up here. He took me way down here and he'd check on me all the time with my pole and fishing. Little wonder that a few months after that, sitting about where Cindy's sitting there, when the invitation was given, I went forward. It wasn't long till I was in the baptistry, a nine-year-old baptized. And I lived close to the Lord, so close that I didn't pray just for tests, but I prayed all the time, even in school and everything. But guess what? I went off to college, and I strayed big. I've never bored y'all with all that. But I strayed big. But on an April evening of 1959, I came into my apartment where his friends had helped me decorate, that knew about decorating, and there was a presence in that apartment. And every sin I had ever committed in my life seemed to fall on me, and I fell to my knees beside the couch. And it was like being in a dark pit. Reminds me of Psalm 40, that God... Psalm said, he delivered me from the miry clay of a dark pit. I grabbed the Bible, which had just been given to us, that the girl I did not marry had given me as a gift. <clears throat> and, uh, <laughs> and I read it through, and uh, though I hadn't been in touch with the Holy Spirit for a while, the Holy Spirit gave me a lesson from 1 Samuel about David, and from the Psalms about David and his sins, and especially the one where David confessed in Psalm 51 and said, Lord, if I could, I'd give you whatever offering you want. But then I read on down, and the Lord didn't want any offerings. He wanted a broken and contrite spirit. Within a week or two, I resigned my job as a successful salesman of Procter & Gamble and started back to get courses to take place of underwater basket weaving and all those other courses I'd taken. And after that, for a short time, the Lord led me to go to Union University. And I said, Lord, I'm at University of Memphis with all these older women I can marry. And that's just kids up there. That's the kid he wanted. And that's the kid I got, and I'm proud to have her. What's God got in store for you? He's got something if you just turn yourself over to him. Not that I've been perfect on turning myself over. Betty is here. She can stand up and give a testimony on that. I'm a very controlling person. Don't like to be controlled. But John Mark said, if you don't get down, I'm going to control you because he's going to. And uh, would the chairman of deacons come down and I'll be close by if you need me. But we know the invitations of church, don't we? The most basic one is put your full trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Another one is align yourself with a church that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and practices. Another one is rededicate yourself if you need rededicating. Please be seated, please. Uh, I don't think this... <coughs> get choked up here. I don't think this young man here is going to need any uh, introduction, but, but this here is my son, Brax. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, been, uh, he's been talking to us quite a bit about, about accepting Jesus. He's already done that. We told him that... Uh, he, he wanted to come, I guess, a week or two ago, and, <coughs> excuse me, he's like many of us sitting out there. He's very, very reluctant to come forward, just like many of you are out there thinking today, that, you know, I don't want to come in front of all these people, but, uh, but he, he has come forward. Brother Tom has talked to him, and, and he's accepted Jesus, and, and, and uh, he puts me to shame a lot of times on the stories he tells, so. Um, but, but him and brother Tom will be talking some more and they'll, he'll be baptized in, in, in this church with you as your family, if you'll accept him. And, uh, and I ask that you do. And, uh, so, but, but him and brother Tom will be talking some more. <laughs> they'll be talking some more and they'll be, uh, they'll be, uh, putting into place his baptism. So appreciate your prayer for him. Let me say that I really remember that. Do you, how many of you remember a five-year-old young lady that came right up here? Brenda Young's daughter and Harold Young's daughter. When she was five years old, came up. We thought she was young, but she took a step toward Jesus and continued to keep those steps. I have an eight-year-old granddaughter who was been born in like Brax. Goes, they talk to the preacher, talk to his parents and everything. And she came forward a few months, a few weeks ago. And the preacher asked her, I hope Tom will ask you this. The preacher asked her daddy, Jeff, would you like to baptize your own daughter? Of course, the preacher is there. We went to the baptism. And guess what Jeff said? He said, Lexi, you are my earthly daughter, but now you will always be my heavenly daughter. Guess who else was baptized that night at Rolling Hills Church? How many of you have seen Dr. Ming Wang's uh, thing of the young 15-year-old Moldavian girl? She had her 16th birthday the week that she was baptized and had a birthday cake there for her. A couple in that church had adopted her and paid that many thousands of dollars for her to have that surgery. And now she's assured of her salvation for the Lord Jesus Christ. I made mine a little older than you, but, not, but I have never had reason to doubt that he is faithful to keep us. I, Salute you and Dr. Tom. 
<laughs> and one of these days you will be Dr. Brax. <laughs> All right, uh, few, few announcements this morning. We won't 